Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Mickelson. I'm the Consultation and Professional Affairs Manager for Boston Site Scleral. Thank you very much for joining our webinar tonight using smart features to design a great fitting lens. I am joined tonight by two phenomenal expert clinicians and educators, Dr. Stephanie Pisano and Dr. Sheila Morrison. Just a, a brief introduction. Dr. Pisano is a graduate of The Ohio State University College of Optometry and completed a contact lens and ocular disease residency following graduation. Dr. Pisano is an associate clinical professor and the optometry division director at The Ohio State Wexner Medical Center in the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. Her clinic mainly focuses on patients with ocular disease and complex anterior segment conditions requiring specialty and scleral contact lenses. She also teaches optometry students and optometry and ophthalmology residents. Dr. Morrison received her Doctor of Optometry and Master's in Vision Science, as well as completed her contact lens residency at the Pacific University College of Optometry. She has previously served on the faculty at the University of Houston College of Optometry and is a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. Currently, she practices at Mission Eye Care Center for Dry Eye and Corneal Disease, where she also co-founded the Myopia Academy. She has been published in numerous academic journals, including Eye and Contact Lens, Investigative Ophthalmology and Visual Science, Review of Optometry, Contact Lens Spectrum, Review of Myopia Management, and the Journal of Contact Lens Research and Science. Clinical research and lecturing on topics related to specialty contact lenses and myopia management are an ongoing passion for Dr. Morrison while serving in private practice. And so before we get started with the presentation, just to let you know, we will have time at the end to answer any questions you may have. As we go through the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you'd like answered in the Q&A panel. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Pisano. All right, perfect. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Dr. Morrison and I are first going to talk about some features of the Boston Site Scleral, and then we'll go into some case presentations, utilizing the features to kind of show some real world examples. Uh, so the first thing that's built into every lens, including the diagnostic lens, is a quadrant specific haptic. This is very helpful because we know from research and data from, you know, papers like the, the scleral shaped study group that most eyes are not round. We have to incorporate some tericity to help the lens center well and make the lens comfortable and be aligned and consistent for the patient. And with the Boston site scleral, this was incorporated from thousands of fits of the pros device and incorporated into the fit diagnostic fitting sets. The diagnostic fitting sets are also separated into right and left lenses. So when you're fitting a patient, you use the right lens on the right eye and the left lens on the left eye. So that's very helpful as well. Using the quadrant specific haptic, you can, when you're in Fit Connect, which is the web-based software, you can make changes to that and see it in real time. And this is what the practitioner appearance is. So you can see each haptic and you can change it by 50 micron increments. You can also change the sagittal depth and the base curve, which gives you a lot of control to change the lens, how you're wanting to see, change it and to see it in real time. And again, this just helps the lens center better, makes a more well-aligned fit. It's more comfortable for the patient to be so specific with these changes. The next feature is an oval optic zone, which again, we know now that the limbus is not really circular. It's more of an oval appearance. So by having an oval optic zone to match this, this really helps with conjunctival prolapse. So we're not getting excessive limbal clearance in some areas and minimal limbal clearance in others. And this is something that's already built in. You don't have to change this yourself. So next, we have to think about how the patient's going to see. And that's always the goal with scleral lenses is we want to help the patient see better in most cases. 
But sometimes you'll be over refracting a patient and they'll start reading the letters and they're kind of hesitant or they'll say, oh, it's ghosting or shadowing or the quality is not that good. And that's where things like smart, smart, smart site technology come into play in this what we call FSE or front surface eccentricity. And this essentially is a way to help the quality of the vision for the patient. And this is built into every diagnostic lens, but then you can also change the amount of front surface eccentricity based on the patient's response and how they respond to the diagnostic lens. And we'll go over a case where changing that was significantly helpful to the patient. And then if you need more customization past just the front surface eccentricity, you can do custom HOA correction. And what's really helpful in this case is it can be used with many aberrometers. You're not stuck using just one aberrometer, which I think is extremely helpful because we want to try to minimize the amount of equipment we have to purchase and the amount of testing we have to do on patients. And if you already have an aberrometer, you can check and see if it'll be compatible with the um, software that they're designing the HOA technology with. And then I'll hand it over to Dr. Morrison for the next part. So one of the next features, um, as we know, we've really come a long way with square lens technology and being able to kind of vault over lumps and bumps. And one of the really nice things that the smart channel technology is used for um, is to fit over those anatomical obstacles. And so we'll talk again, just as Steph said, we'll go through a couple of cases that give you some examples. And I've got a few images on the next slides. A couple of the other things smart channels are really, really good for include reducing lens suction and also promoting tear exchange. Now, when it comes to smart channels, um, you know, there's a wide range of channels that are available to meet the patient's needs and conditions. Um, you can customize these channels for, you know, exactly where they're located and also in the size that you use, depending on what you're trying to vault. So for example, you know, if we're just trying to get some tear exchange, maybe our river that we want running through is not the same type of a channel that we would use to vault over, you know, with the side of a pinguecula, for example. Um, you can actually use one to four channels per lens. So that's a pretty good amount. Um, if you need to go more than two, we can do four now with this design. Now, what you see in this picture is actually an example of that. And so in case one, so kind of at the top, um, the first two circles that you see are um, showing an example of kind of a corneoscleral cyst. These types of lesions make it really hard to fit lenses unless we can do things like smart channels. Because normally a lens without a smart channel, for example, would really just land on that elevated height. As you can see, the tissue really heaps up there in the picture. And adjacent to that first photo on the top left is uh, an image of the lens with a smart channel in it. And you can see that's a, a very good fit over top of that lesion. Now, the second case below is a case of um, Stephen Johnson syndrome. And we're going to, again, go into some more specifics of these cases. But the purpose of channels in this case was to really reduce lens suction um, because we know that that's really, you know, not a good thing for patients at all in any way. Now, when it comes to um, designing lenses today, you know, we've really come a long way and we do have within the Boston site um, lens uh, options that, you know, the lens, the fitting set comes with right and left eyes. Um, we can adjust quadrants, eighths of the lens. Now we're at the digital era. And this is an area that those of you that know me know that I really love to dig into this stuff because it's just so exciting what we can do now um, with freeform designs. In the uh, Boston site um, kind of family, we now have the Smart 360. Uh, this is a freeform design that is available in 16 to 19 millimeters. And basically, the process to get these lenses designed is we can actually scan an eye looking at ocular shape, cornea and limb beyond the limbus into the sclera. Um, we can actually easily now send the data and I'll, you know, be a testament to kind of the, the, um, the where we're at today with Boston Sight as far as the algorithm working a little bit better um, and working really very well, where we can actually digitally design lenses straight from the data, straight to the labs, um, to create these freeform designs. And the scanning tools typically are the, that are currently available right now with the Smart 360 are the, the ESP and the Pentacam CSP. Now the path to do this, um, you know, again, it's just kind of as easy as um, data in, data out. One thing I will say um, for those of us, or those of you that already are using a CSP or an ESP to design freeform lenses, a Smart 360, um, I always like to talk a little bit about kind of the quality of the data. 
because when the quality is good of the scans that you take, um, the you know products are very, very good coming out on the other end. Um, and so the, again, Smart 360 is actually a freeform design, um, meaning or a style that's based on digital data. Um, and in which case we can go from 16 all the way up to 20 millimeters. Now this slide, we actually had a little chat. Chris and I were chatting before about, you know, do we want to keep a slide like this in? Because it is really one of those slides that's, you know, basically the purpose is to say we're at the point now with the smart features, um, you know, from start to finish, fit, comfort, best physiologic endpoint. And that's where we are. And do we need a slide like this? We all are online. We know that we can do this. And I actually asked him to keep it in here. It's almost like geometry, you know, the, or it is geometry, what you see in the slide. And what this is kind of saying to me really is kind of all these little pieces that we have in our toolbox are so cool. And with the Smart 360, it's just kind of one more level of contact lens fitting within the Boston site family, where we can really piece together the tools that we prefer. So, you know, smart channels, the free form to, you know, get a little bit better starting lens. You know, we can build lenses empirically better than we ever have before. And uh, again, all those pieces really have provided very successful outcomes for our patients. Okay, so next we're going to get into some cases. So this first case was a patient with exposure keratopathy. She was referred from our corneal, one of our corneal specialists because she was having eye pain, waking up in the middle of the night, and she had tried multiple options. The affected eye here is the right eye. She's 2040 in that eye, but I always ask the patient to describe to me how it looks. You know, is it good quality? Is it poor quality? Could you read it quickly? And she was really struggling with the quality of that. And you can see her left eye, this eye is unaffected. She's 2200. And if we look at her history here, she had a acoustic schwannoma that was removed. Then she had a lot of issues with imbalance and being able to walk and really difficult physical therapy to go through. And then a subsequent procedure as well. And she was using artificial tears every hour, ointment, but still no improvement in her ocular comfort or her vision. The left eye was reduced due to amblyopia. So we really had to work hard on this right eye to get her the best vision we could, but also the best comfort. So looking at her baseline exam before we started fitting a lens, you can see her lower lid. She definitely has an ectropion. She has leg ophthalmos. Her um, conjunctiva is not injected, but you can see a lot of pooling of the tears, which definitely is going to cause some transient blur and no cataract really. She had some rapid tear breakup time, a little bit of staining, but more so just irregular with, with her forced blink because she really wasn't blinking at all. And this is a video of the patient doing a forced blink the best she could. I always try to see how well they can blink because that's going to tell us if they can clear off the surface of the lens or not. And then I always ask the patient their goals and wearing a lens and if they're motivated to do this process. And she really was to improve the vision quality, but also her comfort was also her main reason. So we proceeded with diagnostically fitting her. We started with the, we're only using the right eye in this case. We pulled out the trial lens, let it settle, and then overfracted her. And she got to 2020. So she was ecstatic about that because to her, going from 2040 to 2020, being a monocular patient, she was very excited. And you can see here, this is a picture of the clearance. It's very even all the way through. We decided when we ordered this to use um, a Boston EQ material just to have a lower wedding angle. We're not gonna use any additional coatings because she can't blink very well. So that can cause some issues with deposits. And then she noted to me, she could slightly feel the lens nasal and temporally. So I just steepened those quadrants and that's where the quadrant specific design is very helpful because the patient can tell you exactly where they feel it. You can see the inscription on the lens and know exactly where to change it in fit connect. And then the last thing we had her do when ordering the lens is update her glasses because she's wearing a PAL over top. So we need to change the top portion of the glasses to be plano. So she returns for her next visit. As usual, we check their cornea, make sure everything's stable from that point. You can see her parameters here of her lens. She successfully was able to apply and remove the lens during the training process in office. So we dispensed the lens with her care instructions and had her come back in two weeks. 
At her two week follow up, she was again still 2020. The fit was still adequate, very even alignment pattern. The dot was generally in the same location. She had a little bit of debris and some deposits, but we expect that. If she cannot blink, she's going to have some deposits. And there's some of that that you cannot control just because it's an anatomical issue. But overall, she was extremely comfortable. She was very happy with the vision and the comfort, which was her main complaint. And then you can see here, I took some OCTs over top of the lens and you can see just very even alignment of the fluid reservoir. There's no decentration. And then looking at each haptic superior inferior nasal and temporal, good alignment in all areas. So overall doing really well. She had the lens on for about six hours at this first follow-up. So at this first follow-up, just per usual, we take the lens out, look at the corneal surface, restain it, see if there's any signs of hypoxic stress, any mechanical disruption of the surface, and she didn't have any of that. So she was doing well with this first lens. There was nothing I needed to change, nothing she indicated to me that was a comfort issue. So I just had her come back a few weeks later during the fitting process just to recheck the fit and make sure she was still adapting well. And coming back six weeks later, she was still doing perfect. So we finalized the very first lens we did, had her come back in about four months, discussed this with her cornea specialist. They were happy. So just a good case of a first lens being the final lens. So for the next case, this is a keratoconus patient, which we all see a lot of. This was a 35-year-old male referred by his corneal specialist. He came in wearing glasses. He was 20-30 in the right eye and then 2350 in the left eye. And he had tried multiple lens designs, GPs, hybrids, sclerals. And he just said, you know, every time I try the any type of lens in the left eye, my vision is not improved. If there's really no improvement that motivates me to wear it. I don't really want to have to put it in and out if I'm not going to get a significant improvement. And he had some scarring in the left eye. So that, of course, contributed to that. His goal was mainly to be unaffected by his vision at work. He needed depth perception. He needed good vision. But he had just resorted to wearing, to gla wearing glasses. And then I think here, if we click one more, you can see his topography. He's very, very steep. I believe his K-max was like 98 or something. And he had some scarring there, a lot of ectasia. So you know his surface is very irregular, and the optics are going to be very tricky in this case. So we diagnostically fit him with the starting lens from the fitting set and the 18.5 diameter. He had an overfraction with some front surface sill and he got to 2060. So I was really excited. And then I started asking him like, hey, do you see better? Do you think this looks better? And he's like, no, it looks worse. It's more distracting for me to see this shadow in this box or double image around the letter. So this is a case where the baseline lens that you pull out of the fitting set, the starting lens is going to have the front surface eccentricity one in it. But if they're ectatic or they have keratoconus or pellucid or something where their cornea is irregular, you can put in the FSC two lens and try the overfraction again. So I pulled out the same diameter, just pulled the FSC two lens and overfracted him and he got to 2025. And vision quality was much better. So in these cases, things that can tell you to use different eccentricities are in my, what I notice is if the patient picks a lot of sill, if they are not overly impressed by a big jump in acuity, you know, have them describe what the, what the shadowing, what the ghosting looks like. And I try to use the same rows or the same letters to over them so they can compare. This is what it looked like with the first lens. This is what it looked like with the other lens. And then there's also FSE zero, which you would use in a case of a patient with a regular cornea. So like a dry eye patient or someone that doesn't have an irregular cornea to see if that different eccentricity helps. So in this case, this keratoconus patient changing it to the FSC two was a game changer for him. And he was actually willing to wear the lens and function wearing that versus wearing glasses. And then going forward here with his fit, the diagnostic lens just had minimal sagittal depth. So again, in Fit Connect and the um, web-based software, we just went ahead and I upped that. You can see in the final lens, a much more adequate clearance centrally over that really steep part of the, of the cone. 
And when he came back wearing his lens at his final follow-up, his lens was fitting excellent, very even alignment in all quadrants. His dots were in the same location we expected it to be. He was very comfortable, no issues with removal or staining after removal. He was able to wear it his full shift at work, which he was very excited about. And then we'll go into the last case here. So this is another keratoconus patient. Uh, she was a 45 year old female that was wearing glasses, but not happy with the glasses she was wearing. And her really goal was to go back to work. So she needed to get her driver's license and this visual acuity was not going to get her to that point. And you can see her glasses prescription. This is a typical you know, advanced keratoconus patient, a lot of sill and just really poor quality in the glasses. So I started talking to her about what she had done in the past for vision correction, because she had noted to have keratoconus for 10 years. She had a transplant in the right eye and she had tried scleral lenses multiple times. And I kind of asked her, you know, what was the thing that caused you to drop out of wearing them? Why did they not work? And her main issue was that the lens felt suction to her eye. And when she would go to remove it, she would hear that popping sound. And that made her extremely nervous, especially with the transplant. She was very nervous. She was going to cause dehiscence to her graft and she wasn't willing to try the lens again. So I told her, you know, we have an option now that can actually help with suction significantly and to see if that would be something she was willing to try. And just going over this design feature, she was. So if we go to the next slide, you can see her topography here. So the right eye, that's her transplant eye, just overall very steep. Left eye is her non-transplant eye. So you can see the inferior steepening there. And we started off with a diagnostic fit using the starting lens in the, in the trial lens kit. And you can see just minimal sagittal depth there. So we'll um, address that. But the next thing we did is go to the next sagittal depth up. So you can actually just change the sagittal depth in the trial lenses, which is extremely helpful. And so the right eye, you can see much more adequate clearance, but it's now decentering a little bit. So we decided to send, center the lens better by steepening that inferior quadrant. And then the left lens looked pretty even all the way through. Her over refraction yielded 2020 vision. She has a little bit of sill, but that's going to mainly vertex its way out. And then in her case, like I said, the main issue was suction. So we're going to add in the smart channels to the nasal and temporal aspect of the lens to preemptively help with that suction issue. So she does not feel like she's really pulling on her eye to get it out, but also it's going to help. She has a transplant, so help get as much oxygen to that transplant as we can. So here's the parameters for her lens. And then these two um, screenshots on the right, these are her smart channel parameters. And this is the practitioner view. This is how you see when you're putting the channels in. And you have free control to put them anywhere you want, um, zero to 360 degrees. And I usually start with the nasal temporal channel when I'm addressing suction and put them at um, 20 micron depth and then 30 micron width. And that's kind of the typical way I start. So this was her very first lens. I put the channels in from the beginning, not even checking to see if she was gonna have suction with the first order. We just put the channels in automatically. And then here's her final lenses. You can see it's kind of hard to see the edge of the lens. They're so well aligned, but she was really happy with reducing that suction issue. She had no issue with taking them out. And I also check this when I'm in the office, when I see a patient, I always take the lens out myself and see if I feel suction. Is there a fit issue or is it a technique issue? Is it her not being able to take it out? But in her case, it was just really the other lens designs she tried had suction to her eyes so much. She physically did not want to take them out. She wasn't comfortable. But adding in these smart channels, that really made a difference for her and really helped with her ocular health to keeping as much of a looser fit as we could without introducing debris or lens awareness or anything like that. Removing the lenses yourself is a, a fantastic idea. And I, I often recommend to providers who are seeing deep impression rings, uh, varying clearances, varying haptic appearances throughout the day to, to also take the time to insert the lens yourself if, if you're seeing that. Um, just yeah, because patients can come up with very odd ways to put lenses in very like excessive force and that can cause some weird landing issues, but they also can learn very 
interesting ways to take them out. You know, they, these patients, they get on Reddit and they get on Facebook and all these places where they're seeing what other patients are doing and they're asking patients to give them advice. So they'll, I had a patient one time that was taking a lens out with scotch tape. He had no removal tool. So that's what he did to take it out. So just addressing and making sure they're doing it correctly can save a lot of time and tell you that it's a fit issue or it's a technique issue. So, but in her case, it was definitely a fit issue with the prior lenses, which is why the smart channels helped so much. I've never heard of scotch tape. Yeah. Right, that's... A creative, you know, the one I did have was I was a resident and a patient was traveling and lost his tools. And he came back and told me that he had actually gone to the kid's toy store and found like the smallest Nerf gun thing he could find. <laughs> that had a little suction thing, those little things that you shoot or whatever. So that's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, it's really incredible what bless every bless their hearts. You know, everybody wants the best for themselves and tries to listen to instructions, I do believe. But things, there's a lot going on sometimes with new fits. And actually, the most surprising ones are sometimes those patients that have actually been in sclerals for years. And then you realize that they're doing something strange with their solution, you know, filling it with preservative containing like, you know, something harsh or removing in odd ways that have created, you know, issues it's like, well, my eyes are red with my contacts. My sclerals are been bothering me forever. Well, why is that? And you dig a little deeper. It's kind of kind of interesting to go. So that's our staff actually are trained to ask every patient, you know, how are you using your solutions? Um, what solutions are you using? And also to go through that application removal. We try to remember every time patients are in to kind of keep an eye out for sure. Now, um, I also love listening to you, Steph, when you're talking about the patients that are still unhappy. Don't we all love that? You know, you, you're a hero. Sometimes I'm so proud of this fit and you put lenses onto somebody and you expect this wonderful response because they were 20. 80 and now they're actually seeing 2025 20, and you're like, I'm a freaking genius. This is my day. And they're unhappy. And it's because they actually would almost rather in some cases just live that bit of blur than have, like you said, their attention drawn to this second image or this little ghost that they can now clearly see. Um, and this is an excellent segue into my section um, here. This next uh, few cases, well, this, I have one case on um, a combined case to give you an example of how we use the data-driven technology to build shape and then how we can also pull into that high-level technology that we have available with um, our HOA technology. And so um, in our next slide, it gives you just a little, a little summary of my main points, but in particular, I'd like to highlight candidate selection. And I'd like to mention that for any of us out there considering HOA correction for patients, you know, typically in our office, we rule out everything else first. So we don't automatically assume that patients are going to be jumping right into this technology because it is a little more involved to fit, but it is there for those patients that absolutely need it. It's a very important population. Those people that are kind of 20 unhappy, and I'll show you exactly how we found, you know, ways to kind of identify the best candidate. The other thing that we always try to do before considering HOA technology um, is to consider, you know, using the FSC um, feature where we can change that first. Um, you know, I won't add, you know, a half or three quarter diopter sill, which without playing around with the FSC values. Um, and I know from our conversations that Steph, you pretty much kind of do the same thing first. Um, and so that's a really important thing to remember when we're considering HOA technology. Now, this case um, is uh, combined with um, to build a, a smart 360 lens using ESP data to build the lens shape. And then we actually put into put smart site HOA correction into uh, a lens for this patient. I'm going to teach you kind of how it went. And what it comes down to is really clearing that fog. So we're reaching the patients that are 20 unhappy. You know, we definitely now are at the place where we have the technology to really make a big difference. And it will become more and more mainstream right now, um, you know, with the Boston site, it's, it is one of the, our, not every manufacturer can do this. Um, and, you know, I really enjoy working with a variety of manufacturers. I don't have financial interest in this company, but I really have enjoyed working with the HOA side of things a little bit because of the big impact it made on um, the patients that we've used it for. They're the ones that get really frustrated because they've tried everything else. Now, when it comes to choosing the right candidate, um, a couple of really important things. We do not want to select the candidate that has central scarring. 
Um, that is not a likely case that we're going to have great results from HOA correction. We do not want to put HOA correction onto an unstable lens. So patients that you're still kind of struggling to get a lens to um, align, to have it be stable every time they wear it. Sometimes dry eye can be a little tricky for this because as you know, or as a lot of us have run into our dry patients often will have those sticky lids and the lens can fluctuate a little bit in that position. And that's really not a great, you know, I usually before considering HOA correction will ensure that over multiple data points, not just a four hour visit, like, okay, where's the lens after you wear it settled for four hours, ready for HOA. We actually want to see that that position of the lens is stable and consistent over multiple data points, because just as much as HOA correction can really make the world clear, it can also, when rotated, make the world less clear than it was before we put it on in. Other ocular disease kind of things um, could be um, potentially contraindications as well um, as unrealistic expectations. Patients who you know, have that expectation that it really is going to solve the world Sometimes it does, um, but there, sometimes it doesn't. Some patients are impossible to please when it comes to that fine, you know, HOA may be able to improve in some cases perfect for some patients, um, but setting a realistic expectation is very important. Now, what we're looking for is kind of 20, 25, 20, 20 unhappy. So we're able to correct them to a high level of vision with minimal central scarring. But what they're describing to you is things like still, even despite changing, playing with the FSC values, you know, um, playing around with that little bit of astigmatism that we can apply to the lens, make sure that we've really optimized all of those features. They still complain of this sort of hard to describe, almost intangibly irritating um, starburst, poor night vision, ghosting, kind of persistent blur on an eye that otherwise you look at it, it's a clear as a bell. Eye health is great on the inside. This person should have really good vision. So those are ones that we kind of start to think about. Maybe would they be a good candidate? What I see happening um, as the future goes on is that we are going to be probably having um, the technology to screen in all our offices more easily. You know, um, not all of us have an aberrometer yet. But again, looking at the analogy of where did we start with corneal topography? Not everyone had a topographer to fit ortho okay, and now look where we are. And so the technology just gets better and better. And we will see that more patients are being screened to see what is happening in that optic over top of the contact lens when it's um, the best fit. So this is patient LG. Um, and again, this case highlights uh, modern digital empirical design based on ocular surface topography. Um, and we use this patient's ocular shape to stabilize the lens. I'll show you how we did that. And then we were able to apply the HOA optic now, um, this patient, you know, 35 years old, not a presbyop yet, um, one eye um, has been uh, cross-linked, but he did have obvious bilateral keratoconus. Uh, the left eye is the eye that we had him in a hard lens, you know, for the past couple of years. So started off with a regular contact lens fit, took me about three remakes. So pretty, you know, reasonable, wasn't terrible, wasn't perfect. I'm um, using diagnostic fitting sets, which absolutely are, you know, we use, we don't always do digital design in our office. We use fitting sets for lots of reasons. Um, and um, at this point, our patient, 2025 unhappy vision, kind of chronic lens awareness and fogging was another side piece. So that's unrelated to HOA. That's just related usually to ocular surface fit. Um, and uh, the patient, his personality type, just to give you a bit of an idea of kind of who this guy is. So he's an engineer. He's very um, investigative, we'll say, with his, you know, there's so much online for patients to find. And I actually have quite a few patients referred in or that self-refer asking me about HOA correction because these are the ones that are frustrated. They look online, find that this could be the solution to their problems. And then they search online to find fitters that, you know, they view to be able to do this. And so I actually have not, it's not uncommon to get these referrals. Lots of them I can correct and kind of solve their problems using some of the other features that we've talked about. But the special population, like patient LG, really, um, you know, kept on bringing it up year after year. And so finally, you know, we were really able to um, look at putting HOA correction into his lenses last year when we have the technology available to us in his in his lens now. Now, kind of as we go on, um, you know, a lot of us are kind of using this analogy these days and. You know, I've thought of this for a long time that each eye is its own beast. Each eye has its own fingerprint. You know, our tools now are amazing and we do have technology in our fitting sets that are, you know, very advanced, um, great guesses and you know, not more than guesses. This is educated um, decisions 
on fitting lenses out of fitting sets that we can use on our patients, different in the right and left eye. We know this. We know that from digital data gathered over large populations that we can, you know, guess at what shape might be most appropriate, you know, in many cases. Now, today, the ocular surface mapping has become such a cool part of my practice um, that, you know, it's, in fact, I actually scan everybody that comes through to, you know, evaluate their candidacy for a lens like this. So in the, you know, in the case of our patient LG, with his case, I don't know that I would right away, um, a couple of years ago, thought to go into something impression-based or digital driven because it was a lot, you know, more costly and harder to fit, take impressions or big scans. And now today I'm finding I'm fitting more and more patients using digital data than I ever have before, because it's just a little faster and things like fogging and some of those kind of annoying things that come up with a lot of our scleral lens fits sort of just go away when we're using, you know, more precise ocular shape. Usually when we do, um, I find a scanner imprinted lenses, and this is also very, reliant on good quality data. So, um, you know, again, junk in, junk out, quality in, quality out. And so um, we're talking when we are able, which is almost, you know, nine times out of 10, and able to get really high quality data very easily using, you know, the ESP and CSP, our scanned or imprinted lenses usually do optimize comfort on irregular eye shapes, absolutely, and on normal shapes. Um, you know, not to say we can't get there with any other style of fitting. I do, I do all styles. You know, usually um, I do find in some cases we can reduce chair time for fits when we're going evidence based off of the actual data driven shape. Um, and the nice thing, though, is when we look at using something like an ESP or a CSP for making a th smart 360, using that shape, that exact shape can stabilize our lenses faster. So we get lenses on the eye. Um, they're more commonly kind of that lock and key fit a little bit faster where the lens can be a lot more stable than playing around with the, um, the haptics in other ways. And just remember data-driven lenses do apply to scler you know, spherical, toric, asymmetrical. Um, it's not just a true freeform where every curve is a little bit different. Um, but data-driven is now available to apply to all these different styles of lenses as well. Here's an example of our patient. So this is um, the eye when we take data um, using, in this case, it was this ESP. Um, uh, on the left-hand side is a scan showing what we see on the screen when we're taking an image. And what the data can generate is really incredible. Um, the image on the, the right actually shows um, a topographical map that goes fairly far as you can see out beyond the limbus. And what I do in the clinic, even if I wasn't going to fit a 360, just to kind of get an idea of what style of lens that I want to use for a patient, I'll actually click around on that data at about you know, 16, 17 millimeters on the scan, just to get an idea of that elevation differences and see, okay, this is a very asymmetrical eye. This looks actually would be a really good fit for a torque shape or a spherical shape. And so this is the data from our patient. Um, and there's a variety of different parameters that show up for you, including, you know, iris diameter can be calculated from the, um, the unit. Um, we can also look at, you know, the height of the eye. And that's very important when looking at choosing a starting lens, for example, um, we can actually use FitConnect um, to directly dial this data in for Boston site. And it will tell us, and my staff, in my case, what I do is our staff will actually do the clicking after they get the measurements and find the best starting lens for example, in the trial set to put on that patient's eye and put it on before I even see them in many cases. Now, when it comes to the, the 360, that's the next level up, we're kind of just utilizing that technology straight into a lens. Um, in this case, I had the data from the patient prior, um, from his prior best fit scleral lens. So the optic I already knew, and um, we were able to digitally design um, a smart site 360 lens just based off of this data. Now the results are sometimes I'm still like impressed. So, you know, even with kind of junky tear film on some patients and where there can be challenges, you know, you would think, you know, is the algorithm effective? Um, and I would, I'm going to be honest, you know, a couple of years ago, the algorithms were still being developed, but today we have, we're at the place where we get lenses like this often on the first round. This is a first fit lens for this patient. And it was, it was excellent. There is about seven degrees of um, clockwise lens rotation and my over refraction on the starting lens based off of totally empirical fit from his prior GP parameters in a different design was a minus 50 with about adapter of sill um, at 73 um, for the axis. 
Now, if you take a look at the next image, this is again, a beautiful starting lens. We're always aiming for somewhere between like two and 300 for the starting height of the lens. And it's usually what we get with the Boston 360 or the Smart Sight 360 um, when the lenses are designed digitally. So, um, and this is not uncommon. I mean, it's a lecture for you to highlight our great cases, um, but I wouldn't say that this is uncommon when the data is good going into the unit, the algorithm's great. Here's an image, again, just showing right on the eye, again, with our um, over-refraction, which we applied on the next lens. Now, the way that things work when we're going to think about getting an HOA fitting lens in, um, basically, um, on the next slide, there's a little video. And step one is really optimizing the fit when we're thinking about you know, creating an HOA um, corrective lens. So best power, best fit, best stability at that point is where we send the data into our lab and they will send us this fitting lens. It's actually marked to show um, exactly um, some certain data points that they need to see. Um, and as again, as you can see in this video, fit is beautiful. Everything's looking really, really good. Now the fitting lens, just to give you a heads up as well, it's not necessarily going to be clear. So that's one thing that um, I did you know, learn um, fitting some of these, these patients. Um, and basically what we do is take the patient in for a scan on top of the lens, on top of this fitting lens. Dilation helps, um, especially um, just to make sure that we get really good clean data. Although I have done a few now where for whatever reason, I you know took a scan and built a lens on a non-dilated eye, but I would recommend dilating the eye, um, go ahead, let the lens settle, dilate, and make sure that we have everything kind of aligned as we expect it to. And then we do, we did an eye trace over top of that lens. Now, at that point, send all the data in and our team over at the Boston site um, lab um, takes a look at everything for us. And um, the third lens was actually the final lens in this case. And so what we got was um, a patient who had exceptional results um, he found that his visual acuity um, was um, better than what he'd ever experienced before. And in this slide, I also do have an image again of the OCT just to again, you know, just show the beauty of this lens. It worked great for this patient. Um, some of the comments from the patient, this is directly quoted. And he knows that I was going to use this at one point to kind of share what he said. And he's very detailed. He came in and kind of started putting little papers by the sink and showing me what he used to see and what he could see now. So he found better eye teaming, eyes work better together, less of a shadow on black lettering, and the starburst is much better. So overall, really great result for this patient. And it all comes down to candidate selection. The next case I want to highlight is um, for us um, kind of... Uh, as a just last case here before we turn it over to Chris to close and kind of finish off with some really important things. Um, so Dr. Bita Asgari has provided us a presentation or a patient of hers that I wanted to present for you. So we had a 36 year old Caucasian male. So you can see fairly um, steep cones, keratoconus, 74 diopters is pretty aggressive. Um, this patient had worn sclerals in the past, but with the main complaint, which we do see um, similar to some of Steph's cases with the kind of sore red eyes on lens removal, vision wasn't great. Um, and patient liked to wear the lens a lot. And we see this with our specialty patients all the time. They are reliant on that vision and they need to wear those lenses full, full time. So this patient um, with slit lamp exam, um, there definitely was a little bit of rebound injection when the lens can't, comes off on this particular patient. And um, I a little bit of conjunctival injection as well. Now, how do we troubleshoot this? So we're really looking to see um, kind of where can we improve? So in this case, patients in an 18.5 diameter. And um, what was done on this patient was play around a little bit with the FSE values. So the, um, the 0 0.3 CT was the lens that she went with. The, EQ2 material was also used. And basically um, the lens was modified just a little bit to incorporate the smart channels. And what we have learned over time with patients um, when it comes to lens induced kind of suction is that it's just like a really, really bad thing. We never really want to have lenses that suck onto the eyes. You know, there's lots of reasons for this, but the most important ones being health problems. So when we have a lens that's really suctioned on and patients are taking it off incorrectly, they're much more likely to have things like microcystic edema, discomfort after lens removal, and then of course the rebound redness. I actually had a patient that I just remembered 
um, in our clinic, um, a couple of, well, over the last six months. And he actually had the craziest thing happen with lens suction where he perforated his cornea, which you'd think that you could never, ever imagine doing that, but he had such an odd kind of removal technique and was traveling abroad and had very thin inferior cornea, um, with Pellucid. And he ended up actually inducing a perforation of his cornea from lens suction. And so we've learned that overall, it's just, there's nothing good about it. And in this case, for this patient with that kind of the tip off being that redness, perilimbal injection, um, and discomfort with the lens removal, um, the lens was size was increased. So increasing the diameter of the lens and smart channels were added. Here's an image um, just showing the refit. And so um, the here is um, just kind of an example here of what we did um, in terms of the refit, where we were able to improve the vision using the different um, optic in the Boston site. Um, larger diameter in this case really helped and also the smart channels. So the biggest thing, I think the take home being smart channels, here they are um, just showing kind of the location um, and where we build them. Again, very similar to what Steph had said was putting them in in the horizontal is usually what I do as well. Um, it seems to work really well just to relieve that section. And in this case, it was, it was a huge success. And here are the lenses on eye. Now in closing, we'll pass it back over to Chris to talk just a little bit more about aperometry. And so actually due to time constraints, I'd like to jump into questions, especially because <clears throat> the, the question that we have in the Q&A right now is something that th the three of us were just talking about before starting the webinar. So the question here is, would you recommend putting one to two channels in every lens just to encourage tear exchange and improve ease of removal? Mm -hmm. We, yeah, we were just discussing this and I actually do this, I would say on almost every patient. I put in nas nasal and temporal channels, just like I did with that one case. And I really don't, haven't seen a downside to it. I don't know if you have Sheila, but I haven't seen a lot of debris or issues with it. I think the biggest thing is you have to tell the patient because if they're a habitual scleral lens wearer or even a GP wearer, you're switching to a scleral, if they hold the lens up to the light, they can see the channels a lot of times. And I have had patients come in and say, oh, I broke my lens or there's a defect in the lens. And they didn't notice it until they left the office and just explaining to them like, hey, you will see these kind of striations in the lens and letting them know that they're there intentionally just and why they're there as long as you educate the patient. But I've been doing it um, pretty consistently for a while on almost every patient, just starting in that nasal temporal channel, nasal temporal area and haven't had any issues. And, and then if we need more, if they have a really deep sag or a really very advanced eye, sometimes we'll add more. Or if you want a very specific location to put the channel based on an obstacle, like Sheila was saying earlier, I'll add more. But usually I start with two, one nasal, one temporal. I think especially if we are, you know, minimizing the size and depth of that channel, we're, we're so much less likely to, to introduce excess tear exchange, potentially introduce fogging debris in the tear film. Uh, my starting point with channels generally being about 20 degrees of width, about 150 to 200 microns deep, certainly no deeper than 250. And so our, our next question is, are lenses thinner or thicker along the channels? And I think the second part of that question should be, do the channels cause any patient awareness? Have, have we had patients complain of awareness or are they happier about the decreased suction? Horizontal, when they're placed horizontally, I wouldn't say that I've had anybody even really notice other than improvement on the suction for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I've never had a patient say they're aware of it. Um, sometimes depending on if they have a pinguecula, I'll work with the consultants to purposely make it thinner um, in the channel and that spot to kind of vault more over top of it. But usually patients are not aware of them. 
Another question we have, is it possible when there is suction to use fenestrations in, in place of channels in some cases? And, and why would we use a channel over a fenestration? So I, I'll go first. I typically try to use channels first just because they are less, um, I think, cumbersome to the patient because it, fenestrations are more of an art than a science. They can be very tricky. And especially when you're inducing a bubble, that can be very tricky to a fragile cornea. So I try to maximize the four channels first from a suction standpoint, but you can definitely use fenestrations. Um, fenestrations, you know, there's a there's a haptic fenestration or an optic fenestration. You have to decide which one you're going to use. But like Sheila said, getting good data, if you can take pictures on these patients and show the lab exactly where you want the fenestration to be, what your, try what your goal is. And the fit can take a little bit longer with fenestrations. But at the end of the day, if you have a compromised cornea, you've done the best fit you can with four channels and it's you're still getting issues with suction, you can definitely use a fenestration. Do you have a preference, Sheila, what, if you do a fenestration first or channel first? Depends on lens design. So with Boston Sight, definitely channel first, 100%. Um, I think it's really good for oxygen flow too. Um, sometimes fenestrations are tricky, like with, like you said, getting that placed exactly where you, it's, it comes down to communicating to the lab and actually showing them where what the relationship is between the landing where the lens actually lands. Because if you're trying to increase oxygen, and you decide, you know, to throw a fenestration in, but it's too far peripheral, you're not getting any gain there. Maybe it helps with suction, but like you said, if you're looking to go inside the landing zone or outside of it, um, the one thing I will say about the, um, the smart channels that kind of eliminates that because you can actually do both with it because you're going to increase the tear flow and you're getting more oxygen, but also reducing suction at the same time. So it is, you know, definitely with Boston Sight, smart or the channel is, is the effective way. In designing those channels, um, that that's that's what I'm for. Uh, contact myself, contact our other fitting consultants. The more information that you can provide to us, the better. Mm -hmm. The better the outcome will be. Take images, upload those to Fit Connect. Uh, contact us at that point, and we can go over everything together. Do we have any other questions? Just in case there's participants out there that haven't really worked with the lens yet, just so we don't really go through any cases that uh, I know both of us, all actually all three of us have mentioned Fit Connect and that we go into Fit Connect and make changes. But basically that software that you can actually go into, upload imaging, send in, you know, pictures of OCT, anterior segment, photography, um, actually look at the lens design and modify it in um, the ways that you want and see it kind of change on the screen as well. Um, and so, yeah, it is very useful to send in. I think, Chris, you like it over on that side when we do send in lots of imaging to actually help with that placement. Yeah, as as much as, as many images as possible, as much information as possible through Fit Connect, you're also able to place a pending order and hold it for consultation. We're then able to review it review any information that's provided and, and all of those images that are provided. We're, of course, also happy to chat with you on the phone, but definitely encourage using Fit Connect. It's a, a fantastic tool. And so if there are any additional questions that, that we weren't able to get to or, or that haven't been submitted yet, um, please reach out to us at, at Boston site, utilize the fitting consultants. Uh, we also would invite you to join our global community. We have a Facebook group, the Boston site scleral fit group. You can follow us on Instagram at Boston site scleral. It's a fantastic way to engage with other providers, learn, view cases that are being posted and, and tips that are being posted as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Pisano, Dr. Morrison. We really appreciate having you here to provide us with such fantastic education. Thank you and good night, everyone.